There has been no championship in the last few decades that's been regurgitated as much as the 2008 Celtics. This lone title single-handedly elevated the perception of every single person on that team, including their coach, Doc Rivers, whose reputation almost solely hinges on that one title. One thing's for sure, this team is iconic and very influential, as it launched the NBA into a new, modern super team era. Would LeBron James have teamed up with Dwayne Wade if the Celtics' Big Three never got together? Would several other players have done the same thing? Some have called this Celtics team overrated, since in the playoffs, they struggled against much easier opponents. However, in the regular season, they sported the 10th highest point differential of any team in NBA history. Statistically, they were comparable to teams like the 90s Bulls or the 2016 Warriors. But today, nobody really sees them this way. They don't look at this Celtics team and think they're one of the most dominant teams of all time. They never became a true dynasty. Why did such a phenomenal team during this illustrious saga fail to win more than one title? How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, let's continue this series. Previously, I've made videos on why the 2011 Mavs and 04 Pistons were not able to repeat and win another title, so check those out if you haven't yet. I'll put them in the description. Without further ado, let's begin. When Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen joined Paul Pierce in Boston, they had one goal in mind, to win the championship. To rekindle the glory of the Boston Celtics, a decorated franchise that hasn't won anything since the Larry Bird era. Right off the bat, they found immediate success, winning 66 games and being the championship favorites. As we all know, their struggles in the playoffs were quite a surprise, getting pushed to seven games in their first two series. Even to this day, their 26 playoff games in the postseason is still the NBA record for most games played in a single playoff run. One can look at this and think of them as a resilient team that weathered the storm and grinded their way to the end. Others can look at this and see, wow, for a team that was this dominant in the season, they sure didn't look like it in the playoffs. They should have swept some fools. Over time, the opinions have been leaning more towards the latter. Several players over the years have come out and said that the coaching held the team back. Glenn Davis claimed Doc Rivers was, quote, lucky as hell to win in 08. Doc also got criticized for his lack of in-game adjustments, and instead relied on their stars to make those adjustments. It was more than just the coaching, though. Let's take a detailed look at what went wrong in the subsequent years after the 08 championship. So, shortly after winning the title, the Celtics' goal was to repeat and get back and win again. They wanted to run it back and bring the entire team back, and they almost did, with the exception of James Posey. He signed elsewhere for a larger payday, and you might think losing him wasn't a big deal. However, Posey was a major piece on this squad. He was their sixth man. Both in the regular season and playoffs, he played more minutes than anyone outside of their starting lineup. Posey was a big small forward who matched up well defensively, and could shoot threes incredibly well, especially for back then. His 38% from three on four attempts a game off the bench was sorely missed. Letting Posey go was a move that even Doc Rivers admitted was the first domino to fall. Fast forward the following year, and once again, the Celtics had a stellar season, but a couple of things made them weaker. In addition to the loss of Posey, both Tony Allen and Kevin Garnett suffered some crucial, untimely injuries near the end of the season. All season long, they anchored the team's defensive identity, and by missing extended time, the Celtics' defense had a noticeable drop near the end of the year. They still finished with the second-best defense in the league, but it was a step down from what they were used to. Most importantly, KG, the reigning defensive player of the year, underwent knee surgery in May of 2009 forcing him to miss the entire playoffs. In the second round, they lost to the Magic in seven games. But you gotta wonder, if KG was there, he likely tips the scale in the Celtics' favor. Even with a legendary performance from Rajon Rondo, the Celtics had a striking lack of size, being forced to start Glenn Davis in KG's absence. Against the Magic's bigger front court, they struggled to contain them. The difference in points in the paint and three-pointers heavily favored the Magic, as they made 19 more threes in this series, and scored 51 more points in the paint. It was impressive they were this close to winning without KG. In fact, I believe this was their best chance at repeating to win back-to-back -back titles, 
It was just so unfortunate with the timing of his injury. We now move on to 2010. I think the 2010 Celtics have a reputation for coasting during the regular season. People say that, but it wasn't just that. There were some notable changes to the team's offensive structure that caused them to have severe inconsistencies. The most glaring change with this team centered around the emergence of Rajon Rondo. With their core of stars getting older, the dynamic of this team shifted. They were the second oldest team in the league now, right behind the Dallas Mavericks. The wear and tear, the long grind of the regular season was a struggle, as the Celtics lost more and more games. The problems began on the offensive end. Their offensive rating dropped from 6th to 15th. To give you an idea of what I meant when I said the offense was now built around Rondo, this is what I mean. In 2008, Pierce, Allen, and Garnett were assisted on 32%, 54%, and 68% of their two-point shots, respectively. By 2010, they were now assisted on 41%, 64%, and 82%, respectively. They weren't given the ball as much to create their own plays. Instead, the offense relied on Rondo hitting them at the right spots, to get them a good look. I think, in theory, it should work out. You put the ball in the hands of your point guard, and Rondo's a great passer. In reality, the ball movement suffered. There were times when Rondo held the ball for way too long, and their offense became much more predictable with one guy controlling it. Rondo, as great of a player as he was, he's never led any of his teams to an elite offense. Contrast to guys like Chris Paul or Steve Nash, who've led their teams to top three offenses for many seasons. However, their struggles in the regular season were soon quickly forgotten. When the playoffs began, it was quite clear that the Celtics were still the team to beat in the East. They reached the finals, I wouldn't say easily, but it was quite convincing, much more convincing than their 2008 run. Neither of LeBron's Cavs nor Dwight's Magic stood a chance. Oh, you can tell from watching these series that the Celtics were in full control. They were not gonna lose. This brings us to the rematch. The Lakers sought revenge, while the Celtics were looking better than ever. With a 3-2 series lead, Game 6 starts. Midway through the first quarter, Kendrick Perkins goes down. The Celtics get blown out. Now, I know Perkins has become a meme after his career was over, but at this point, he was a critical piece of the Celtics, a tough interior presence who they desperately needed to counter the Lakers' bigger lineups. Celtics fans will always point to the Perkins injury as the reason why they lost in 2010. But did he really make that much of a difference? Well, yeah, he kinda did. Without him anchoring the middle, the Lakers destroyed the Celtics on the boards in Game 7. They snatched 23 offensive rebounds, with Gasol grabbing 9 by himself. Had Perkins been available, there's no way the Lakers would have dominated the glass like they did. In games 6 and 7, they out-rebounded the Celtics by 13 in both games. Before that, they were relatively even on the boards. Perkins, in the previous three games before Game 6, averaged four offensive boards. Their rebounding woes were exemplified after he went down. Keep in mind, they were already one of the worst rebounding teams in the league, so to see their best offensive rebounder get hurt, they could not recover. After this season, the Big 3 Celtics would never get this close again. The 2010 offseason saw the formation of Miami's Big 3, and almost immediately, they were the favorites to win the championship. The Celtics made some moves of their own, losing Tony Allen in free agency and trading Kendrick Perkins in exchange for Jeff Green to add some much-needed offense and youth. Sadly, Green got diagnosed with a heart defect not too long after. This year was kind of a, a transition period for the Celtics. They were objectively a worse team than the year before and had very little depth. As expected, they got trounced in the playoffs by the Heat. As you can tell, there was a huge shift of power within the Eastern Conference, as the old Celtics slowly faded away. But not without one last attempt. The lockout-shortened season had everyone scratching their heads, wondering if an NBA season would even happen. For the Celtics, one thing was on their mind, getting revenge against the Heat, and capturing another championship that eluded them in the previous couple years. Sports media outlets and journalists believed they were done. They were too old, too slow, their team has gotten worse over the years with no upgrades. That's what everyone thought after they got demolished by the Heat. 
It was supposed to be a sign that their window has closed. Everyone expected Danny Ainge and the Celtics front office to blow it up. He believed they had one last run in the tank. There were two major changes this season. One, the rapid development of Avery Bradley, who turned into the Celtics' best perimeter defender at the young age of 21. Heck, he even replaced Ray Allen in the starting lineup, which <laughs> Allen wasn't a fan of, but it was working. And two, trading away Glenn Davis for Brandon Bass, a faster, more agile player than Davis, who matched up well against stronger small forwards too. This trade also moved Kevin Garnett to center. As the league was going small, Garnett, even at his age, his mobility and positioning was still very good, and this role suited him well. With these upgrades, the Celtics once again reclaimed the honor of being the best defensive team in the league, number one ranked in defensive efficiency. They would meet the Heat once again for a rematch. After playing well the first five games and securing a 3-2 series lead, I'm sure we all know what happened next. At the end, the Celtics ran out of gas, and the Heat proved to be the superior team. LeBron, at his absolute peak, was too much for the Celtics to overcome. There were a couple of notable absences that maybe, perhaps could have turned the tide of the series. Jeff Green was out all season, recovering from heart surgery, and Avery Bradley got injured in the middle of the playoffs, and did not play against the Heat. Their rigid, tired offense could have used a spark that Green could give him off the bench. At times, it looked like they couldn't do a single thing against the Heat's suffocating defense. Heck, with the Celtics being ranked the 22nd best offense in the league this year, it was a problem we expected them to run into. Their struggles on offense has been a running trend for the last several years. They've always relied on having superior talent, with a well-defined game plan on defense to carry them to wins. But when you run into a team with even better talent, and more athletic with also a fantastic defense, they were simply outmatched. Still, they had a chance. They were so close once again. Afterwards, the following seasons were marred by Rondo's ACL injury, Ray Allen's departure to the Heat, and eventually, a complete blow-up of the team. Capping off the Big Three era with one championship in six years. Anyway, that's all folks. I think what we've learned is that it takes an incredible amount of luck to win the title. The Celtics had very unfortunate timing with injuries, missing several key players in series that were so close they could have maybe won. Of course, injuries happen to everyone, not just the Celtics. Perhaps there were times when they themselves got lucky, so you can't really just chalk it up to injuries as the reason why they couldn't repeat. With their big three getting together near the downswing of their careers, everyone knew that their window to compete was very small, very short. I still believe it was a huge accomplishment to win even one title, and the cultural impact they had on the entire NBA landscape. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.